not. Good, e good evening, everyone. I'm Luke Schaefer, Associate Dean and Herman and Amalia Cohn, Professor of Social Justice and Social Policy at the Ford School in the University of Michigan. On behalf of Dean Barr and the faculty and the students of the Ford School, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's policy talks at the Ford School with my colleagues, Shobita Partha Sarathi, uh, John Chachari, and Justin Wolfers. No doubt many of you may have noticed that I am not Michael Barr, although I hope to one day perhaps play him in a made-for-TV movie. Michael, and, and you may have noticed that Justin Wolfers is not Betsy Stevenson, his decidedly better half. Uh, they are no longer uh, gonna join us for tonight's discussion because they've both been named to the president-elect uh, transition advisory team. So in the interest of allowing for an unencumbered discussion about the next administration, they have graciously bowed out of tonight's event. That our faculty and our affiliates are advising the new presidential administration, I think is one of the great things about the Ford School. And in fact, our faculty have served uh, at high levels in the Obama administration, the Clinton administration, George H.W. Bush, Carter and Nixon administration when uh, Marina Whitman, our faculty emeritus, was the first woman named to the Council of Economic Advisors. So this is just one of the assets of a place that is committed to rigorous research and policy analysis and uh, done for the common good, impacting the world. So John, Justin, and Chabita and I are thrilled to be here though, and we look forward to a wide ranging discussion on the policy priorities and goals of the next administration. Before we dive into the conversation, I wanna thank our co-sponsors for tonight's events, the University of Michigan Club of Washington, DC, and the U of M Alumni Association. The University of Michigan has a significant presence in Washington, including our public service intern program, the Michigan and Washington program, the University of Michigan Office of Federal Relations. Alumni efforts also fund need-based scholarships for promising DC area students to attend the University of Michigan. So a warm welcome to our U of M alumni who are watching here today, especially in the DC area. Let me briefly introduce our panelists, each of whom represent a slightly different area of policy expertise. Professor Shabita Partha Savrathi is a professor of public policy and the director of the Science and Technology and Public Policy Program her research focuses on the comparative and in international politics and policy related to science and technology. She's interested in how to develop innovation, innovation policy, and how to better achieve public interest and social justice goals. One of my favorite things about uh, Professor uh, Shabita is that her work has influenced the 2013 United States Supreme Court case challenging the patentability of human genes. Justin Wolfers is a professor of public policy and economics. Justin's research interests include labor economics, macroeconomics, and the political economy. He is a contributing columnist to the New York Times and a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and the Brookings Institution. And he was recently named to a list by someone as one of the 10 most influential economists leading into the Biden administration. Finally, uh, John Chachari is an associate professor of public policy and director of the Ford School's Wiser Diplomacy Center and International Policy Center. His research focuses on international law and diplomacy. He has been an Andrew Carnegie Fellow, an Asia Society Fellow, a Fulbright Scholar, and a policy official in the Treasury Department's Office of International Affairs. All right, welcome to all of my colleagues. Shabita, I want to start with you. So uh, obviously, uh, President-elect Biden has talked about the importance of getting a handle on the COVID crisis. And uh, you know, we might imagine major shifts in policy as it relates to dealing with the pandemic. Could you talk to us a little bit about some of the things uh, that you're thinking about, some of the top priorities in this area, and uh, what you'd like to see in day one, and maybe what you expect to see? Yeah, sure. So, um, and first of all, thanks, Luke, for um, 
having me, and I'm excited to, to speak to everyone, including uh, University of Michigan alumni, and probably, hopefully, some of my former students out there. Uh, so yeah, uh, clearly of Biden's top priorities, COVID is at the top, and he just today, in fact, was having a meeting uh, with governors, I believe, about uh, about the COVID response. Uh, and in his uh, plans, he's planning first to expand testing significantly, which I think is uh, incredibly important. Uh, he's also talking a lot about um, a creating something called he's calling a U.S. public health core uh, of contact tracers, and that part of it I think is interesting because one of the things obviously we've all lamented this year about the uh, scarcity of COVID tests, uh, and it seemed at, at one point that we had a, uh, perhaps we were uh, supply and demand were meeting, but we're now again in it. I think as the as the uh, demand increases, we're we're in a, a scarcity situation again. Um, so certainly it's welcome, uh, this push for increased testing. But one of the challenges that I think we've also seen, but we aren't talking as much about, and I appreciate that um, that they are doing so in the new administration, is to talk very seriously about contact tracing and actually making sure that we have enough contact tracers. I think that's really, really important and key in the, in the response. Um, it's also, though, important to think when we're thinking about contact tracing and um, testing and isolation, the three pieces that we've been talking about in terms of COVID prevention, to think about um, cultural and social specificities. So there have been numerous examples of how testing isn't necessarily uh, uh, being given in the right neighborhoods, in the right places, uh, that people are reticent to participate in testing systems because they're concerned about being surveilled. Uh, there's concerns also that they might get um, uh, a COVID result, but then what do they do with that information? That there aren't social supports available, for example, uh, for proper isolation. For a lot of people, you know, uh, it's it's very costly to isolate. You have to leave your job. You might even lose your job. Uh, so these kinds of things, I think, need to be a more um, significant part of the response. I'm glad that they're they are um, taking some steps. I think they. I would like to see even more attention to um, questions around how do we make sure that people properly isolate themselves, and how do we ensure that they have the economic and social supports to do that. How do we make sure that the public health core that they develop has the cultural competency uh, to really have people participate in these systems. So those are the kinds of things we're thinking about. The nice thing that I've noticed in the COVID task force is that there actually does seem to be some expertise on that task force focused on questions around structural inequality. So there are clearly people thinking about it. Uh, the question is, um, how integrated will that be in uh, in the test, trace, and isolate response that might emerge? And, and I think that remains to be seen, but I, I hope that when we move forward, we'll actually think about it more holistically than we have um, over the last year. Great, thank you. I'm gonna just do a round with everyone and then come back again with some follow-ups with folks. Uh, Justin, we are, um, in a sort of an economic time that uh, there's just no comparison in history, right? And so I'm wondering if you could just take us through uh, what's happened to the economy as a result of COVID, um, where we're heading right now, and uh, what you think in terms of setting economic policy should be some of the major priorities uh, starting in January. Yeah. So look, one way of thinking about this is we do have to turn the, the language we use a little bit on its head. So um, I think there's, there's two things happening at the same time. One I call a suppression and the other is a recession. Uh, if you took macro at the Ford School, you know what a recession is. Uh, you know, a generalized downturn. We've seen those before. A suppression is literally what was happening in March, April and May, which is um, through some combination of people are unwilling to go to market or there are lockdowns that prevent them, we all just stay home. We, we don't work. But at the same time, our employers don't call us into work. Uh, we don't consume, but at the same time, the shops may not be open. So thinking about whether that's a demand shock or a supply shock, mm -hmm. you know, the answer is yes. Uh, it's one of those wonderful exams where there's no wrong answers. Now, you know, what that suppression does is 
you shut down the economy, there's no economic activity. Now, in fact, we kept 90% of the economic activity going, which is its own special miracle. But losing 10% in one quarter is unheard of. Uh, this is a downturn that played out in days, whereas typically a, you know, a Great Depression or 2008 plays out over months and years. Um, so that suppression happened. And then if you recall, just before the election, there was a lot of talk about rapid GDP growth. Well, the thing is, if you tell everyone they can't go to work, and then you tell them they can go back to work, you're going to bounce halfway back. But if the down was big, then going halfway back up is a tremendous rate of growth. So those dynamics are dramatic, but at some deep level uninteresting because it's all going to go away. The question is, when we get to the end of that suppression, what state's the economy in? And we're certainly at the end of that first stage of the suppression. There's a different question whether the second or third wave of COVID is going to cause us to lock down again. And, you know, we're discovering the unemployment. We're, we're still 10 million jobs down. Um, the recovery is rapid because basically you put everyone on furlough and you just tell them to come back to work. Getting rid of unemployment when it's just calling people back to work is easy. Most of whom the people left are people who've lost their jobs altogether. So the hard work begins now. So the dramatic recovery we've seen, it's over. And now it's going to be a long, mm -hmm. slow grind. And the question is how long and how slow and what role does policy have to play in that? Um, obviously, Biden's uh, brought to the table the idea that we need another major fiscal stimulus. This is a case where, you know, we are in unprecedented times. After the 2008 recession, a fiscal stimulus of 700 billion was seen as a lot. We went through 2 trillion already with CARES. And we're talking about, you know, there are big debates between the... Republicans who want one trillion and the Democrats who want three. Uh, these are phone numbers. Talk um, about uh, shifting the goalposts. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and you know, it's really hard to know because the suppression is so dramatic. It's hard to know what the underlying damage is. If it's as bad as some hope, fear three trillion won't be enough. If it's as good as some hope, most people are getting back to work anytime soon, and three trillion would be a terrible answer. Um, and so you know. The best I can say is we live in interesting times. John, let's turn to foreign policy. Gosh, this is so much fun, by the way. I'm having a really good time. Uh, John, uh, take us to foreign policy. So I can't imagine what it's like to enter in, you know, a new administration that's going to take a completely different, I, I imagine have sort of very different views of how to interact uh, in the world internationally, but to do so in a time when uh, you can't really travel. So my understanding of um, foreign policy is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, State Department uh, folks and in presidents, they go over, there's uh, huge divides, you know, they have dinner together and, uh, and suddenly um, either uh, people see uh, connections with each other they didn't before. It just it seems like there's a lot of the personal and the international. So talk us through you know what you hope to see in this circumstance and and whether or not there are sort of unique things related to the current period that make it more challenging. Well, I think we've we've lost your sound. I'm going to give you a couple minutes and I'm going to come back. Sound good? Uh, Shabita, uh, I have been, of course, like everybody else, following uh, vaccine development uh, very closely. And uh, I um, was just struck by the notion of the Pfizer vaccine that has to be kept at uh, negative 70 degrees Celsius, which I believe is something along the order of negative 90 uh, Fahrenheit, uh, which uh, is something along the orders of like really, really, really cold. Nearly as cold something as on the order of really, really cold, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how can we possibly deliver a vaccine uh, in the huge numbers? And, and maybe you could just walk us through like even just like if it were easy to distribute, what kind of logistical task that we're talking about? Here. It's huge. Uh, and let's be uh, clear about it. We 
don't have we we've demonstrated this year that we're not necessarily the best at uh, distributing technologies in a sort of uh, equitable or any way systematic way. So we don't have the best track record. Uh, the first good news is that there is a vaccine that looks promising, and in fact, there are multiple vaccines that look promising. There are, you know, just news today that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine also looks good. Would that be number three? That's number three. I think right. there's also some hope about a Johnson & Johnson one. Um, so there are multiple ones. The only one that requires the giant freezing, uh, really, really, really cold freezer is Pfizer. Um, Moderna's requires only a regular old, I believe, refrigerator even, not necessarily yes, freezer. So, so there's cool. some variability, um, but it is a it's a it's a an enormous task because we don't just need um, you know we need to have a sense of how to distribute. We need all kinds of equipment in order to distribute at the. Um, uh, at the levels that we're talking about, um, you know, we are talking about millions, tens of millions of doses in the next couple of months. And what we ha we know is that at present, the states, different states in the U.S. have uh, begun to uh, offer plans and say, this is how we're going to distribute it in the states. And of course, in a federalist system like ours, that's how we're, you know, the, the responsibility gets devolved. But even within that, we're making a lot of assumptions about distribution channels, capacity, you know, personnel. Uh, and, and this is a place where, you know, there are many places and maybe we can talk about it later. You know, what have we learned? What, what in the, you know, once we're past COVID, what can we, what can we learn from our experience? But we are likely to fa face staff shortages. Um, we're likely to face equipment shortages. Uh, we might have transportation challenges. So, you know, we should still be breathing, uh, certainly not holding our breaths as we're waiting for the vaccine. Um, one of the concerns that I haven't figured, we haven't figured out how to manage, but I think is something that we need to be thinking seriously about is the fact that even if you think about the, the super cold freezers that Pfizer is talking about, um, one of the things that's already begun to happen is, for example, that rural hospitals are starting to buy up freezers at a rapid clip. Uh, and that's problematic for a few reasons, right? Are we going to run out of freezers? Are we going to run out of freezers? Are, is it going to drive up the cost of freezers, which is going to, again, distort where the freezers go? Who is managing this? Can we build freezers quickly enough? Um, those are the kinds of questions that, um, the Biden administration is gonna is probably already thinking about. They're gonna have to deal with hitting the ground running. And at the same time, you know, and this is something that's incredibly important that we have to make sure that we are um, uh, still doing the test, trace, and isolate mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so, if, for example, places are moving all of their investments into super cold freezers, what are they not paying for? Uh, Health-wise, and that's a that's a serious question because this can potentially be a very um, uh, um, destabilizing moment at a moment when the COVID the number of COVID cases uh, is going up. And I think the the final thing that I'll say, and um, and you know, I'm happy to go into this further, is that it act there's also you know it's important to remember that. Of course, COVID isn't just a, a local or a national problem, it's an international problem. And the uh, Trump administration has uh, really had a go it alone approach in terms of buying a lot of doses. The Operation Warp Speed has been um, very successful. Uh, it's an interesting case of how we can invest and, and produce um, uh, medical technologies quickly and, and effectively. Mm -hmm. but. In order for us to get back to some semblance of normalcy, as someone who spent used to spend a whole lot of time on airplanes, it certainly matters to me and many, I think, of the people who are watching today that we we think about a global vaccine um, distribution. And that raises uh, questions that are near and dear to my heart around intellectual property. And there have been a number of countries, for example, who have suggested that, especially since 
the government has already paid for, uh, the U.S. government has already paid for these vaccines, uh, vaccine development, the, the industry has not laid out money. You know, there's a question about how much profit should they be making? Should they be charging um, outside of, of the U.S.? Um, should they be making their intellectual property, not just their patents, but other forms of intellectual property available so that generics companies in Brazil or India or South Africa can start to develop their own dosages? Because that's going to be key, you know, in order for us to quickly as a as a globe really respond to the um, uh, respond to the pandemic. So there are those, I think, foreign policy dimensions of it, too. And, you know, given that this is admi an administ not to step onto John's toes, but this is an administration that hasn't necessarily played nicely with other countries, uh, one could imagine that an interesting way that the Biden uh, administration could start with global mm. diplomacy would actually be a much more um, uh, open, act open uh, position when it comes to vaccines distribution and development and intellectual property that could um, perhaps get us back into many countries' good graces. So before I go to John, let me just do one quick follow up on this. In in um, if, if I'm the guy who created a vaccine that has to be stored at negative 70 and my competitor just created one that just has to be cold, I'm I think I probably, you know, in a normal world, I just I just close up shop. Right. Uh, but it sounds like it doesn't quite work like that in this case. Uh, and that um, they have the benefit of uh, the products already been bought? They do have the benefit of the product already been bought. That's true with all of the major vaccine trials. Uh, it's also true that we need as many players uh, as possible to produce as many doses as possible. And then finally, it's important that we don't know what the data looks like. Uh, we've we've heard about the data, but we haven't actually seen the data. And so we don't know what kinds of challenges might emerge along the way, um, in which populations, which, uh, which kinds of vaccines are likely to be most effective. So those are all questions to be asked. So these are not, these are not just um, vi uh, vaccines that require different kinds of storage and distribution. They're also different compounds. Uh, and so they might have different effects. And so, you know, they're all sort of angling for um, obviously the largest possible market. But often what you see is that different vaccines may have different efficacy in different populations. And so mm -hmm. that that is the question that we don't know the answer to, but could mean that, you know, Pfizer's vaccine might be useful in a particular population. But again, the market doesn't look the way we might think a traditional market looks like because they've already sold all of their product before mm -hmm. they even um, uh, began actually creating any doses. So if I'm understanding you right, we should let a thousand flowers bloom, the more the merrier, And uh, but uh, it's not time to stop wearing your masks anytime soon. Yeah. And we need to take contact tracing a whole lot more seriously. Yes, yes, okay. exactly. Well uh, said, Mark. <laughs> John, uh, John, let me put you into conversation. So uh, Shabita has a plan to uh, improve our standing in the world. Um, uh, maybe tell us what you think about that and then also what you know some of the particular unique challenges are about um, uh, foreign policy in the time of COVID. Oh no. Oh, still no, still no sound. You get one more try before we vote you off the island, actually. <laughs> Justin, I have a quick one for you, uh, and then we'll we'll kick it back to John in a minute. You but can ask me all the yeah. foreign policy questions. I'm going to oh, yeah. channel right. my inner you, John. You had divines on this, actually, uh, ahead of time. All right. So, um, yeah. You can ask me the yeah. capital of any country in the world. Australia. And I'll, I'll oh, Google wait. it in I another window. That one. Um, uh, so, Justin, um, I, uh, a friend of mine actually sent me a quote of yours, and there's a, a, a fairly significant amount of nuance in it uh, from one of your appearances on one of the news channels. Um, I believe you said uh, Larry Kudlow is a clown and hasn't gotten a single thing right in the last six months. So, I wonder if you could. Uh, you could pick apart that nuance for us. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is one of the problems about the Zoom age that we live in. When you go into a TV studio, you know you're meant to, you know, wear a tie and look absolutely serious. And when you're at home talking to someone over over a webcam, sometimes you say what you mean. Oh, it um, sounds like there's a paper to be written there about it. Yeah. <laughs> People letting their defenses down. Um, you know, look, the reality, Luke, is it was an unbelievably underqualified economics team. And I want to say that without a hint of ideological bias one way or the other. Um, Codlies are, are made for TV. Um, you know, he looks like an economist, um, a little ugly than your average economist, but beyond that, he has the overconfidence and um, and, and that the people demand, frankly. Um, but, you know, watching, there's a deep question, uh, not about Republicans, but about my profession of economics, which is, we became, as did many professions, decreasingly relevant to public policy over the last four years. Um, the quality of people attracted into uh, government service was a lot lower. The quality of people chosen, and also the influence. The Council of Economic Advisers was no longer a cabinet position, for instance. Um, the president went shopping on his favorite network for his next economist rather than looking through the universities. Um, and it's easy for us to sit at home and say, well, you know, I didn't like this guy. And a lot of us have that view, but I think there should be, for all of us who are in fields that have become decreasingly relevant, uh, you know, remember the president was elected and he was nearly re-elected. Um, we need to look within and see how it is that we failed and how we failed to communicate to a broader public in such a way that it was politically acceptable uh, to recruit, hire, retain, and take advice from second tier people. And by the way, the cost of this in economics may be large, but the cost in public health is even larger. You've got Scott Atlas in there who uh, has literally no more expertise around these issues than I do, um, suggesting what we should do is go for herd immunity, which is basically let the virus rip um, and hope a few people are left standing at the end. And he was uh, one of the leaders on the coronavirus task force. Um, so, you know, how we restore the integrity of advice from from tall people like John um, is, uh, you know, I think mm -hmm. Could you um, tell us a little bit about uh, the role of economists in a, a typical administration? So when you think about um, how, uh, how do you envision uh, a President Biden using a Council of Economic Advisors and, and what role they would play? Yeah, look, for some of my past students, I hope are, are, are there, watching tonight and you know the promise I made you in class is that economics is an important language within public policy um, and for a variety of policy debates it may be the most important um, uh, and that has historically been true and I think will be true again there is sort of the technocratic center of the Democratic Party there were challenges to that through the primaries but Biden is of that technocratic center um, you know look the, the reality is um, policy is boring um, you know, it's meant to go through these long processes. You're meant to have feedback from all sorts of wonks at all sorts mm -hmm. of places. We run models. We try and figure out cause and effect. Um, and, you know, it's slow. It's, it's, it's boring, dreary work. And I can't wait for the day that public policy is boring again. Um, uh, make policy dull would be, uh, I think, you know, what I'm, I, so many of us are hoping for. Um, and I think we're about to see it. And actually pulling politics off the front page back to page three, page five, page seven, I think will certainly be very good for my mental health and, and possibly many of the rest of us. John, do we have you? You, you, now, 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 you now you actually are muted. Have you got me now? Yeah. Yay. Sorry, I switched to my phone. Sorry about that. All right, take it away. I've, I've given you a couple of different questions, so you get to just pick uh, whatever you want to talk about. Nobody remembers. Sure, the my first questions. I do. Uh, the first question you asked was about how diplomacy is conducted in this virtual era and the difficulty of reaching out to partners at a time when you can't take trips abroad and and hang out in the in the uh, conference rooms and in diplomatic dinners. I, I think that. The new Biden administration has a, a real advantage in this regard in that he personally and the people he's most likely to appoint to senior positions have a lot of foreign policy experience. Um, 
Obviously, Biden does not want this to be the third term of the Obama presidency. He wants to put his own mark on this administration in a variety of ways. But much of the message that he needs to provide internationally in order to restore U.S. Restore US image and credibility is a message about normalcy, continuity, a return to a more conventional foreign policy approach. And for that reason alone, he probably will want to appoint a number of senior people who, uh, who were from the, uh, from the Obama administration. The benefit of that in this virtual era is they don't need to start new relationships. They need to reconnect in many cases with people uh, whom they've worked with for many years. Um, the, the current administration, the Trump administration, chose deliberately to bring lots of new faces into Washington to show its break with the past and that it was going to pursue a very different foreign policy. Uh, Biden's approach is likely going to be to want to restore a sense of continuity, uh, and that should help a lot in this regard. It'll also help him in that any president who arrives in office always has to make the difficult decision of where am I going to take my first overseas? Uh, who am I going to please? Who am I going to displease by my choice of travel? In this virtual environment, uh, they won't have to make some of those choices. And they'll have mechanisms that have become normalized and routinized by audiences around the world to broadcast foreign policy messages to a very, very wide audience rather than an audience that's geographically defined. Now, that does have a drawback. Diplomats sometimes tailor their messages or often tailor their messages to a particular locality. Uh, that's a little bit less possible if you're operating through some of these virtual channels. But still, I think on balance, this is an advantage for, uh, for the initial messaging. Biden didn't get elected for foreign policy reasons. Biden got elected primarily to deal with the things that Justin and Shobita are talking about. And he's going to have to spend, and his administration will have to spend most of their early political capital, uh, whether it's in Washington or in the States, addressing issues like COVID and the economy. He's not, not going to have a lot of bandwidth to deal with foreign policy. And so some of that initial messaging might actually be conducted more efficiently through technological channels than through a series of overseas trips that would take him away from Washington and the crisis at hand. I, uh, I like your point about, uh, you know, it's possible that um, a President Biden could be on like three Zoom meetings with three different countries at about approximately the same time. And uh, <laughs> so maybe he, may, he doesn't, he can just not alienate anyone. He can be everywhere. Uh, that's, uh, that's good. But tell me a little bit. I, it's my understanding that you, so I, I hear what you're saying about sort of veteran folks coming in um, for top posts and already having established relationships um, and sort of setting a message. Um, it's sort of my understanding that a lot of career folks have exited, especially from the State Department. And is there a concern about there just sort of not being enough uh, bodies to do all of the work that we need to do? There is a very real concern about that. There are different categories of pe people, of course, who left. One is a category of people who were in very senior posts and chose to take early retirements. I don't think that a large number of those folks will necessarily get back in government. Some will probably seek to return. And then there's the question about whether the Senate will confirm senior level appointments promptly. So there's very much a concern at that level. A second very important category of people who left were people who were in their mid-career phase and climbing fast, who had to make a decision about whether to double down on their career as diplomats or whether to do something else with the next phase of their careers. Many of those chose to do something else for the last several years. And it's my hope, but also my expectation that a good number of them have been frankly uh, displeased with the way American foreign policy has been conducted for the last few years and will eagerly jump at the chance to come back in a deputy assistant secretary role or an office director role, uh, a political counselor in an embassy, and hopefully replete the, uh, mm -hmm. the very lean foreign service that we have at the moment. You mentioned this question about uh, cabinet selections and approval from a Senate. So, you know, obviously, as we look back on the election, uh, it returned uh, uh, a Democrat in the White House, a Democrat majority in the House of Representatives and a Republican Senate that um, approves many of the positions. So how much of that is an issue in terms of what uh, President uh, Biden, uh, who is put up for those roles? Do you expect there to be uh, difficulty um, getting people approved, and, and will that shape the course of policy? 
I do sadly expect there will be difficulty getting approvals from the Senate. Uh, Biden probably, based on his own foreign policy proclivities, was not inclined to uh, to, to send uh, radical candidates to Capitol Hill for confirmation. And so my guess is that that to most Democrats or even independents or moderate Republicans, the people who he'll be putting up for senior foreign policy roles will not be very controversial, but some of them will still get held up. And there used to be the expression of politics stops at the water's edge and, and a bipartisan consensus on America being strong diplomatically and militarily uh, abroad. Uh, sadly, I think that we're a lot further from that than we have been at any point in our recent history. Uh, it would be quite crippling uh, to U.S. efforts to, uh, again, restore our global image, our credibility, if the Senate were to hold up uh, many of our senior appointees. Uh, Shobita and Justin, let me just throw the same question to you all uh, as you think about the course of uh, getting cabinet approval for um, science and technology and public health officials, as well as um, the folks uh, driving economic policy, Justin, uh, what are we in for? Well, I mean, certainly when it comes to uh, cabinet appointments, that that is a real concern, I think. It's not traditionally, when it comes to the science, technology, and health sectors, there haven't necessarily been the spaces where there has been a lot of controversy, but it's possible that the lesson that um, Senate Republicans have learned from you know the Trump era or Trumpism is that everything um, is subject to challenge, critique, uh, and and that includes sort of technical um, technical people. Uh, one of the big you know there were a couple of concerns uh, over the last few years. The first that um, uh, that even you know cabinet appointed. Um, technical advisors were um, were highly uh, political actors, and um, you know you can think about, for example, um, Health and Human Ser uh, Services Secretary Alex Azar um, as as being a pretty good example or a pretty bad example, depending on um, how you look at it. But then the second problem too has been um, the sub level cabinet appoint appointment. So the folks underneath them who are also highly political and it's sort of dipping further and further down and controlling um, uh, the bureaucracy in um, in significant ways. And I and I, I have to say, and I, here I echo what, what Justin was saying earlier, that that I hope that the last four years has taught us that we need to potentially be think, you know, thinking differently about expertise and bringing in voices that feel that they've been uh, marginalized or neglected by our institutions. And and what does that mean for um, how we think about policymaking and who the who the experts are and what the evidence is? But I think that some of the bald. Um, politicization of science has also been deeply problematic. Um, and I am, uh, I'm hopeful. I, certainly there's been um, a lot of discussion that, you know, that, you know, certainly Biden says he's going to try to uh, uh, bring back more reasoned uh, appointees, but, um, but it's unclear what that means in the context of what Senate Republicans are, are willing to accept. And if they feel like they are in a power position, they might push uh, against people that they perceive as uh, being too too progressive or too liberal for their tastes. Mm -hmm. Justin, you wanna weigh in on this? You know, one answer is that nobody knows. Um, there's actually not a long history of knocking out a bunch of appointees at this point. Um, obviously the more controversial ones do. Um, we have to see what happens with the Senate. Um, you've got Mitt Romney quite clearly no longer a Trumpist. No one knows. Um, mm -hmm. One hopes the Democrats are not going to um, negotiate with themselves. Um, on the economic side, I, I'm not that worried. So um, obviously the Treasury Secretary needs to, to get through. Biden's already announced he's going to, he's figured out who his Treasury Secretary is. The leading candidates in most people's book, uh, Janet Yellen, former chair of the Fed, unimpeachable uh, in terms of both integrity and um, just mm -hmm. qualifications. Um, Lael Brainard, who's currently on the Federal Board of Governors, same, same, same. Uh, Roger Ferguson used to be a, a vice chair of the Fed, exactly the same. Each of those three people would get through, I think, in a heartbeat. Um, 
If the president wants advice from people who are unconfirmable, it's easy. What you do is you appoint them a counselor to the president. They don't get to run a big department. They can still run as much of the economic policy process as they want. And then the other set of appointments really matter for economics, uh, the Federal Reserve Board. And um, honestly, the first half of the Trump administration, he made a bunch of really good appointments. They all got through. Something snapped at some point and they started um, nominating genuinely clowns. Um, but the good people still kept getting through. And I think that that norm of trying to continue, both sides being committed to wanting to appoint good people at the Fed is likely to continue. Um, so on the economic side, I think they'll get good economists there. You know, if you want to try and appoint Bernie Sanders, the Labor secretary, that could cause fireworks. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm moderately optimistic. Okay. So um, in some respects, we could be in a fork in the road to see if uh, we're able to sort of reestablish some traditions as I'm, as I'm listening to all three of you, um, or are we, you know, continue to be in a new world of governance um, that in some respects we have been in the last few years, uh, but that also there are sort of um, ways that uh, maybe can move past any impasse, uh, in, including sort of thinking about exactly where your personnel goes. Uh, and what it means for a confirmation. Good. So let's talk about uh, where there might be agreement. So we have a question from the audience. Um, what policies does a, a Biden-Harris administration likely see successful movement on early in their term? Uh, and which policies might they stip op opposition? Does anyone have a sense of of what administration might bring forward uh, when and, and what might get through and, and where we might see sort of the first uh, fights. I think one of the big fights we're going to see fairly early on is going to be about the size of the fiscal stimulus. Um, it's, you know, the lesson we learned from 2008 was you'd get both sides to agree on the first stimulus. Um, the economy remained rotten through 2009, 2010 and 2011 and they couldn't get a second stimulus passed. Um, if they went back to the same scorched earth politics of um, wanting to make this a one-term administration, um, a weak economy, it's far too cynical. But, uh, you know, I do think the lesson of 2008 was that can be a big one. I'm much more optimistic that the money it'll take to get the rest of the sort of COVID relief done will get through. One, a bunch of it's spent. Um, the vaccine commitments were made. Two, a lot of it's actually very cheap. Um, Shabita talked a bit about her concerns about vaccines being expensive and the like, but you know we're talking about forty bucks a dose um, for something that's economically and personally transformative. Um, you know it might be hard to track down enough freezers. There may be labour shortages, things like that. But the stakes here are so much higher um, that the underlying costs hopefully won't uh, get in the way. Um, and the other answer is that what the feds don't do, you've then got a fail safe, which is you've got the states that can step up. Now, the big problem is the states don't have a lot of budgetary room right now. But if I were a state governor and I had to decide where to spend my money, um, making sure that the virus was not going to um, cause death and destruction in my state would be pretty high. But again, we've seen even that has become clearly very, very politicized. Uh, before I go to Shabita, Justin, I, uh, one thing you said earlier was just about this sort of shifting goalpost on what a um, uh, stimulus might look at like, right? And uh, I still, uh, even now, remain shocked about the CARES Act and how actually successful it was in enhancing the economic well-being of poor Americans in particular. Right. We see some measures actually where uh, there was almost no increase in hardship and, and maybe even some improvements, at least for the summer. Yes. And I just wonder, like, do you have an explanation why uh, we, we had never done anything like that? And uh, was it just sort of the unprecedented moment that, that got that kind of package through? I think the, a big part of the answer is, is definitely much more polit politics and political psychology than it is economics, which was this was a holy shit moment. Um, there was no book on the tech. There was no file up on the, the bookshelf that you could pull down. And then I, I deal with this. Yeah. Um, the other thing is the CARES Act had a lot for business and a lot for uh, families. Something for everyone. Yeah. And so the, I think, I mean, they shoveled a ton of money out through PPP. Um, whether that money should have been giveaways or loans is something I think we're going to spend the next 10 years arguing about. Um, but, you know, 
Republicans were very worried about businesses going under. I don't want to caricature sides as being completely on different, you know, but, and folks like you, Luke, were very worried about families putting enough food on the table. And then there were some really weird things, right? Like, why did you unemployment insurance get kicked up by $600? Because it was really hard to reprogram the computers to do anything more sophisticated. So they just right. said, what the hell, let's do it. And so they accidentally reduced poverty uh, along the way uh, for a limited period. You know, so I think two things are remarkable. One, the size of the initial stimulus is remarkable. So was the economic shock. The second is the extent of fatigue subsequent to that, of reform fatigue, that the unemployment insurance money ran out. Uh, you know, Republicans wanted one trillion, Democrats wanted three trillion, so they compromised on nothing. Um, so the follow-up was also remarkably weak as well. And so this is where... If you worry about politics, you worry about the politics of all this. Yeah, yeah. Shabita? So, Lou, yeah, I, you asked initially about where we think um, there might be movement, and uh, you know, every yeah. almost everything that uh, that almost every one of the major priorities right now, I think, is highly, highly um, polarized, but. You know, in, in reflecting on your question, I was thinking about a couple of areas that, that where there might be some room. One is, I think, um, in terms of the dreamers uh, and immigration policy specifically around DACA. Um, obviously, immigration policy generally is um, very fraught and even more so, I think, in the Trump era. Um, this is a place where you'll see Trump, you know, this sort of legacy, I think, um, last for a long time. But uh, there's, you know, we historically talk about the fact that there's a lot of agreement on on DACA, and I wonder if that might be an interesting place where, um, uh, where there might actually be a number of people in the Senate who would be, um, uh, you know, who want who would want to push mm -hmm. that forward, even though it's not one of, um, you know, the top priorities that Biden has been talking about. It could be a place uh, where there might be some uh, some agreement. I think a second place could also be around, you know, to continue to move the ball forward when it comes to criminal justice reform. One of the things that Biden has talked about is how uh, one of the first things he wants to do um, in office is to, um, you know, uh, let's say repeal, I don't know that that's exactly how I would put it, but uh, uh, should put it, is uh, the crime bill, uh, the 1994 crime mm -hmm. bill that of course mm -hmm. made a lot of news uh, in this election cycle uh, and that Biden has you know, said he made a mistake and, and many of the other authors like uh, have also said that they, um, uh, that they erred and um, you know, that criminal justice reform is actually a place where Trump said, you know, Trump actually did pass something. So in some ways, you know, there it seems to be some Republican interest as well in criminal justice reform. And certainly, you know, if you look at the polls and you look at exit polls in particular, there's, there is interest in um, across uh, parties in um, questions related to racial justice. Now to Biden's credit, he talks about racial justice in economic terms, in health terms, um, and not uh, um, traditionally, uh, we tend to, you know, equate racial justice and criminal justice reform. Those shouldn't, they're not synonymous, but, uh, but that's obvious. Criminal justice reform could be a place, for example, where, um, where you could see Democrats and Republicans, um, aligned in some places, not all. I think there's a lot of distance, but there may be some, you know, in a lot of dimensions of that, but perhaps in some parts of, of criminal justice reform. Luke, let me just, I just wanted to add one thing, channeling the fact that we don't have a political scientist among us, so I'll play one on TV. Um, look, I think the big unknown is um, the future of Trumpism mm -hmm. after Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a fork in the road. Which way does the Republican Party go? That fundamentally shapes what's open for agreement. Um, is it going to be the Biden-Trump land or is it going to be Biden-Romney land? Um, those are very, very different intersecting sets. So I want to, in a few minutes, ask you all to, I want to sort of go back in time and talk about the election, and then I want to talk about the transition in particular. But as I listen to you all, and I'm, um, you know, if I put on sort of my glass half full mentality, it sounds like uh, we could have at least three vaccines starting to be distributed in the, in the spring, a much more robust contact tracing program, uh, some sort of... Um, economic stimulus that, uh, you know, even if it were where the 
sort of the lower bound that we're talking about is maybe one trillion dollars. Um, and, you know, potentially the, the rest of the world um, being happier with us, John, because we aren't behaving the way that we have been. Um, that, that sounds like a pretty, oh, and of course, uh, Shabita, you were just saying, maybe we get a little movement on immigration reform, common sense immigration reform, and, um, and changes in incarceration. That, that sounds like a, a pretty good agenda. Am I, I, I'm putting the cart before the horse, you think? Well, I mean, I think I'll speak on the foreign affairs side and say that the uh, there's some easy work to be done. This is relates to your question about what Biden could could do easily and what he couldn't do easily. There's I'm some here. very easy work to be done to repair relationships in terms of the tone and tenor of the way we communicate with our allies, for example. That's a day one benefit. It's like Obama getting the Nobel Prize before he had been in office very long right. because there was so much hope and aspiration for his administration. The Biden administration is going to have a lot of goodwill greeting it at the door in international affairs. It's going to make it very easy to turn the page in terms of tone and rhetoric. It's going to be much more difficult to make progress on the substantive issues that have bedeviled the last several administrations. Getting back into the Iran nuclear agreement, the Biden administration would like to do that. It's not easy to do that. The Iranians realize that American leverage is much less than it was when the deal was negotiated several years ago because the Chinese, the Germans, the, the French, the Russians are all invested in Iran now and the threat of multilateral sanctions is diminished. North Korea, no administration has been able to manage that problem very effectively. Trump's uh, approach to it was the most unorthodox and to some observers loopy approach to try to uh, meet with Kim Jong-un uh, going from zero to 60 in, in 1.2 seconds. Uh, but the follow-on diplomacy ran into the same problems that, that previous administrations have. The North Koreans do not have an incentive to denuclearize. To the contrary, they have a very powerful incentive to maintain a nuclear deterrent as their ultimate regime insurance. And we could go down the list. Those are just two examples. Getting out of Afghanistan. Both Trump and Biden would like to see U.S. troops brought home stepwise from Afghanistan. But Biden will struggle for the same reason that the Obama administration did, because the Afghan government is not in a position to be able to maintain effective sovereignty over that territory. And a Taliban victory would be not just a matter of sunk costs, but a matter of, of potentially staggering human rights violations against the Afghans who have served alongside us for 20 years. And, and, and these are just a few examples of the vexing problems. We could add Syria, Yemen, dealing with China on trade, trying to reverse the course of events in the South China Sea, all areas in which a Biden administration will, will have a more, I think, helpful approach, a more multilateral approach, working more closely with allies, all of that is the right thing to do, but still will struggle to make fundamental progress because these are difficult issues for the United States. And and John, just, let, can I just follow up real quick? John, um, can you explain to me what just happened this week? I saw headlines and then um, as I do, I didn't read the article, I just thought I would ask you, what was the, um, didn't the Trump administration sort of say they were gonna start pulling back troops uh, from Afghanistan? And, and what was that and, and why did they do that? They did. So uh, one, one answer is that Trump wants to fulfill a campaign pledge uh, and that he promised that he was going to get the United States out of Afghanistan. Uh, it's something that he seems to be personally committed to. He has been pretty consistent on this point throughout his administration. He wants to pull the troops out. That's why the United States signed a deal with the Taliban, not really including the Afghan government in those negotiations, by the way. Um, it was a deal that effectively signaled to the Taliban, in my view, that the United States wants to get out uh, and therefore we should bide our time, wait until the U.S. leaves and then negotiate with the Taliban, for, um, with the Afghan government from a position of strength. Now, the military, the U.S. military has wanted to delay this process because there's a recognition among the top brass that despite their disinterest in seeing more American body bags come home, that the alternative to depart fully from Afghanistan would be strategically reckless and again would subject the population to possibly staggering retribution. And so you had the very unusual uh, series of events in, I think, September when a senior Pentagon official said one thing about the U.S. intent to draw down and a senior 
general in the U.S. military said, actually, we're going to do it in a more phased way. Uh, it's very rare that you have that type of discord between what's coming out of the civilian and the military leadership. But it was indicative of the fact that many people who are uh, uh, in, in the military uh, believe it would be irresponsible to pull out too quickly. The Afghan government is shaking in its boots about that prospect and also countries around the region. And so uh, my hope certainly is that that Trump before leaving office will only be able to do a little bit of that uh, and that there will be a residual force in place when Biden takes office so that if need be, he can build it back slightly or at least maintain that presence, which is essential for the Afghan security forces to hold off the Taliban. It's not so much the number of US troops on the ground that matters, it's the fact that the United States provides air support, provides intelligence, provides logistics, provides medical facilities, a whole bunch of supportive infrastructure, and above all, the prospect of possible major use of force in defense of the Afghan security forces. Without all of those props behind it, the Afghan army may collapse quickly against the Taliban. So it's a, it's a, it's a, in my mind, it's a very dangerous six weeks uh, for that mm -hmm. country. And I hope if they get out of it, um, that the Biden administration will take a measured and gradual approach. I guess I just, you know, when I think about a desire of a president to fulfill a campaign pledge, I think of it as in part sort of a goal of, you know, winning the next election. But do you, is this something that a President Trump just really thinks is the right thing for the country or, you know, I'm just trying to figure out what the reasoning is and, and maybe we just don't know. I, I, the, the answer is I don't know, but there are at least the, the, the speculations are that he may be thinking about 2024 or he may be thinking about his own personal sense of his role like in history. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I opened the question with a, um, a question about the possible upside on a set of things. And John, you really I'm, I'm just going to say you took it in a much different direction, but let me uh, let me let me try to flip it back to an upside for a second. I don't know, you know, Shabita, you were uh, um, we're going to, I think, add something there. Uh, maybe it's on the upside or not. I mean, John ignored where I was going, so feel free to, <laughs> to do the same thing. Um, yeah, I mean, what John was saying is in keeping what I was going to say, but hopefully maybe with a slightly more silver lining. I like I like where you're going with this sort of positive thinking. I mean, the original question or the previous question you asked us was about, you know, what does Biden do with a Republican controlled Senate? And the I think the upside or at least um, the reality is that we're now in an era where presidents are using executive orders more and more um, when they have divided government. And, you know, Biden has already talked about the fact that on day one, he's going to be, you know, rescinding a bunch of Trump executive orders. And we can expect that he's going to issue a number of additional executive orders on priorities that he cares about. Um, and I expect those to be you know, along the lines of the priorities that he's already um, uh, articulated, certainly I think around COVID-19. I also think climate change uh, is another mm -hmm. clear example where he's going to be um, issuing a number of executive orders. I'm sure he'll also try to uh, uh, use rules and regulations to his benefit. And I think that where, you know, um, Trump, it took Trump a number of years to um, figure out how to manage the rules and regulations of the US government. You know, Biden's long experience, I think that, and his team's long experience suggests that they'll know um, how to how to move the rules and regulations process quickly. Uh, and that has long-term impacts because when you think, for example, about innovation related to climate change and some of the executive orders and rules that the Obama administration uh, put into place, even though some of them got challenged in court, it actually forced the industry to change, to shift. Um, and once the once the um, car industry, automobile industry, for example, starts to make, you know, to reduce its emissions and its vehicles, you know, the fact that then the next administration uh, changes their mind, you know, it's very difficult for the auto industry to keep shifting back and forth. And so you see a number of those kinds of things from Obama to Trump. And my guess is that mm -hmm. Biden will also try to um, uh, leverage that as much as possible along the, you know, along the priorities that um, that he's talking about. One of those things in terms of the upside uh, is 
actually taking advantage of existing regulations that Trump didn't take advantage of. To, so for example, when you come um, to COVID-19, for example, one of the um, controversies, if you remember in the spring and early summertime was around the Defense Production Act that um, he really didn't ever take advantage of in a significant way. My guess is that that's another place where, um, you know, Biden will put some money, put some attention. So I think that that ability to take advantage of what, what levers already exist um, and the kind of increased power of the presidency um, that we've seen over the last few presidencies um, he's likely to use to make some as to take advantage of as much as he can, um, and I think that that's probably where you'll see some of the upsides mm -hmm. that you were okay. talking about. Yeah, so a mix of uh, potential uh, uh, cooperation with um, Congress, but also using the executive powers, and and then it sounds like um, you know people sort of moving ahead on issues despite no action from. Uh, um, from Washington for a while, and uh, and that maybe uh, is a positive thing in the long run. Can I have yeah. a chance redemption, Luke? I wanted to say. Yeah, okay, sure. I'm just giving you a hard time, of, but of please, unvarnished positivity. Rejoining the Paris Climate Accord is not a panacea for climate change, but it is an it is an important signal entirely within the president's power that will that will be a concrete manifestation of a desire to lead through multilateral engagement. And that's a big deal. Uh, so, yeah, and what, tell us what that looks like. Um, how, how do we re-enter and uh, is that something that is going to happen, that might happen? I, I think it's quite clear that, that uh, the Biden administration will rejoin it perhaps on the first or second day yeah. of the new administration. And uh, it's a pretty simple process. This is not a this is not a treaty obligation. This is a uh -huh. uh, basically a multilateral equivalent of an executive agreement, and and uh, you know it's voluntary pledges. So uh, again, it's not necessarily uh, going to turn the Titanic in terms of of international uh, management of the climate change challenge. But I think it's a very important signal, and will be uh, uh, will be something that Biden can certainly accomplish. Another thing I think that falls in the similar category, very important symbolically as an indication of the direction the administration will take, is to change the caps on the number of refugees admitted, uh, admitted to this country, which is shamefully low in the last few years, especially in light of the scale of of forced migration uh, in many mm -hmm. parts of the world. Mm -hmm. That's something that a new administration could do more or less on its own. It can't change the asylum law, but it can raise the cap on refugee admissions. I think that would be a very, very well received move. I think it will happen. I'm very optimistic about it. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, in one last positive note uh, before I allow um, professors back into their natural state of pessimism. I'll just mention <laughs> that uh, I've been working on something called the fully refundable child tax credit for quite a while that would be an expanded benefit to all low and moderate middle income families uh, with children. Other countries call it a child allowance, but because we might like to make policy boring, as Justin says, we call it a fully refundable child tax credit. And the idea is that uh, raising kids is expensive and uh, every family should get something like $250 a month uh, to do it well. And uh, I love it because it affects the families I care about the most, uh, very poor families, and uh, uh, and then middle income families as well. Uh, and, um, you know, I've been working on this for quite a while. Uh, just a few uh, weeks ago, um, our colleague Betsy Stevenson mentioned the idea in testimony between the House Ways and Means Committee, I think. And since then, uh, now uh, Mitt Romney has identified it as one very clear possible place for uh, collaboration with a Biden administration. So um, it just goes to prove that uh, people listen to Betsy more than they listen to me. But I like to think that I, I, I laid the groundwork a little bit. And so that um, could be exciting. Okay, we can get out of positivity. I actually, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that we here are a, a, a collection uh, Generation Xers. I don't know if uh, the three of you identify as Generation X, but uh, I'm just going to sort of guess. And um, I would just also go out on a limb and say that uh, Generation X is the best generation if only anybody remembered that we existed. Um, and uh, this all relates to an audience question, which is that um, uh, 
Both the Democratic and Republican parties are dominated by leaders in their 70s and their 80s. Uh, do you all have ideas about either side, how we can appeal to younger voters uh, in terms of policy, perhaps by, um, you know, in the future, putting a Generation Xer up for uh, uh, the presidency? What about the generational divide? Justin? I think the facts are just stunning, right? So the Democrats have got Biden at the top, Pelosi and Hoya. Um, wow. And while the Republican leadership, you know, McConnell looks that way, there's a much clearer secession plan there. Um, hmm. You know, Rubio, Hawley, um, you know, it, 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 Cruz is not that old. Uh, he's not that young anymore either. Um, so I think you can actually see the next generation. The, the, next, the next Republican leader is certainly going to be younger than any of these guys. Um, it's crazy. I don't get where it comes from. I guess, you know, one answer is, you know, you get good at doing your job and you keep doing it. Um, and so maybe you should declare success. Uh, you know, there's obviously some awareness that they need to groom, you know, someone under the age of 80. Um, so they're, they're, you know, calling, you know, maybe some spring chickens in their mid-70s. Um, it, it, and it's also stunning seeing all this. Remember the youth of Obama. Um, and he brought a lot of youth with him. Um, and so, um, you know, look, young voters are out there and, you know, they turned out in force. They really did care and they do care. Um, but how it is that they can succeed within current political institutions, it turns out you can run for president. Mayor Pete proved that. But actually rising within these parties, which have very strong seniority norms, um, seems to be a lot harder. Although I have to speak for my fellow South Asian uh, vice president elect. Uh, she is not in Generation X. I just checked. She's just one year out from Generation X. But, uh, but she is a younger um, uh, a younger candidate. She obviously embodies, um, you know, a wholesale historic change, both as uh, as a woman, a woman of color, a black woman, a South Asian woman. So, so you know, there's a little bit of hope out there. Uh, I would say, um, and put it in, and and um, right. I'm supposed to be optimistic, uh, and so no, I'll no, say that. Well, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 okay. I just want the viewers to know exactly what our faculty Christmas party is like. So, <laughs> you know, Troy goes over and he gets the punch bowl and throws it on the ground and it's rotten. And uh, he yells at him because, you know, that was too optimistic. And Luke just sits in the corner saying, What about the poor? What about the poor? And um, doesn't anyone uh, think of the children? And, uh, yeah, yeah but I, I guess I would say, um, so it'll be interesting to see how she's received and what kind of power she has, as I think that they, certainly Biden and um, Harris, they, there's sort of hints that, that they're envisioning a, a more of a partnership um, uh, um, executive. So that, I think, will be interesting to witness, especially because clearly she has design and so on running for president again. Um, but I also think it's worth noting that... Um, that in addition to what Justin said, which is that of course young voters turned out in droves, that uh, Biden was advised by many in younger generations, Generation X, Millennials, um, and um, Generation Z. And you know, for example, and and it's interesting how they all, you know, many of whom were supporting um, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, sort of came into the tent. Um, and came into the tent in, in fact, in advising Biden. So an uh, example of that is the Sunrise Movement, for example, which, you know, is very progressive when it comes to issues of climate change. But then people in the Sunrise Movement became major climate advisors to Biden. Uh, so so it will be interesting to see whether and how that sticks, what that means for the next um uh, the sort of next generations of leadership, and also what that means more generally, I think, for the direction of the Democratic. Um, Democratic Party, but there's clearly some sort of legs now that I think are more clear into those younger generations, but not as clearly in elected officials. I like that you alerted me to uh, the, the vice president-elect that Harris is just one year away from being Generation X, but it turns out we're not choosy, so maybe we can just uh, adopt her. <laughs> that would be great. John, I, used, uh -huh. I was just going to say, I think she's going to have a really, a much more consequential role than some vice presidents do because she needs to be the one who connects with younger, more progressive voters whose 
whose concerns are somewhat distinguishable from those of older Democratic voters. And, and, uh, and, and the administration also will probably need to appoint a few people who can communicate. They're clearly getting a lot of requests from the progressives who, young progressives who supported them and saying, we turned out, we helped you win this election. We want representation. We want a voice in the cabinet. We want a voice in the White House. And so the personnel selection there is going to be key. Uh, if, if the administration is seen as as limiting or shutting down those voices, they're going to hear about it in the midterm elections. And I'm sure they're smart enough to know that. And so above and beyond their sort of desire to reach out and cultivate the next generation, they also have a near-term self-interest in making sure that they that they continue to draw on that energy, because that's where the energy is in the Democratic Party. It's from young progressives, it's from it's from minority voters and who are turning out in record numbers. And so uh, Harris, is, Harris is certainly has the potential to be really influential as a VP. Shabita, you started as sort of starting to talk about um, how we interpret the election. And so I wanted to just uh, turn it back to you. And, and then I'm going to go to Justin, who's already said he's, he's, he's very happy to pretend to be a political scientist. Um, so, um, but how do we think about this election? So I just think about the fact that, um, that Biden-Harris got more votes for president than any other candidate uh, in, in history. And now Donald Trump got the second most votes uh, uh, for president for any candidate in history. And of course, there's you know population adjustment and such. But it certainly wasn't. Uh, it was it was not terribly close in the popular vote in the end, uh, or really in the electoral college. But uh, it was not a matter that uh, there weren't people who a lot of people, the most ever in history, that sort of showed up. So how do we think about this? And and some of this question that's already been raised about you know, what happens um, with uh, constituents who really feel passionately about uh, President Trump? Yeah, so, and I should say, I play a political science, a pol political scientist at 8.30 every morning, Tuesday and Thursday. So, so today is my day, I guess, of uh, <laughs> That's good. Bring in, so you're in the right evening day. show now. That's yeah. right, this is the, the evening, uh, evening section of my uh, politics of public policy class. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, it it was certainly a surprise, obviously, for for many people, uh, how much uh, support there was for Trump. I mean, certainly there was obviously a repudiation of him as well, and that's really what this election was about. And um, and I think it's it's uh, important to understand, um, you know, that it was a very diverse and significant tent of people who voted uh, against Trump. But I think I do want to um, emphasize something that I said briefly before, which is, you know, I know there's a lot of critique of the endless um, gazing at Trump voters to understand what constitutes a Trump voter. But I think that there is a um, something going on that's been going on, I think, in black and brown communities uh, for, for decades that now we're seeing in, um, you know, more on the right, which is a real feeling of disenfranchisement from government, um, alienation in our government institutions. And, um, you know, we see that all over the place. And I think that as I personally, this is something that I think about as a professor of public policy, how do I um, uh, train my students to operate in that world and what are the kinds of challenges that emerge? How do we, um, you know, so many of these people, I think, on both sides of, you know, uh, on the margins, have been on the margins. They, I think many of the people on the, on the right um, saw in Trump uh, an opportunity to be heard. He sounded like he heard them, right? Um, whether or not he actually did is a separate question to me, but he sounded like he heard them and that is why, uh, they voted for for him, and so I think that the that we can talk about misinformation and conspiracy theories and how they were wrong, and you know the sort of the racism, which I certainly am deeply concerned about. But I think we have to think about what, how do we have to think differently about government? What kinds of perspectives and knowledge is not um, is not a part of the system that needs to be. Um, are we relying too much on too narrow an establishment um, uh, in terms of expertise? And what kinds of new mechanisms can we include to ensure that communities and, and publics are part more centrally um, 
part of decision making? Can we make it more flexible? So those are the kinds of things that for me, this was a signal that even when for many of us, it was a shocking uh, turn of events that he continued to get so many votes, even um, after everything that he's done, um, that seems so traumatizing, it's because people felt heard. Um, and, um, and I think that that should cause us to really uh, rethink our, um, the centrality of our expertise. Mm -hmm. Justin, can I turn it to you? Yeah, I got lost what the question was, mate. Um, uh, the question is about uh, how do you interpret the election and, uh, and sort of things that you see as you look at uh, who got votes where and uh, in the overall levels and, and what they mean going forward. Sure. So, look, one answer is that uh, Biden won the popular vote easily and clearly has the confidence of the country as a whole. Um, and it's only an accident of the electoral college that this even looks close. And even when you look there, it doesn't look that close. Um, I think one of the mo more interesting things is you can go a step deeper, where did Trump come from? Um, and what are the deeper institutions that led to, not Trumpism, that's what Shabita spoke about, um, but actually how is it that someone so outside the mainstream could have captured the presidency? And a big part of that is our, our literally our first past the post electoral system. And so one of the interesting things that came up was Alaska uh, just passed a move to rank choice voting, mm -hmm. joining Maine. That, in fact, I think is the original sin, which is in 2016, you had Cruz versus Kasich versus Trump. Mm -hmm. The Kasich and Trump Cruz voters both hated Trump and they were a majority of the Republican Party. So a majority of the Republican Party did not want Trump. But we had a first past the post system, which effectively led Cruz and Kasich to crowd each other out, allowing a minor player to take the nomination. And so, you know, I, I do think people, it's, it's a great time to be thinking deeper about our electoral institutions. Um, you know, ranked choice voting always made a ton of sense to me. It eliminates, you can never, we have deep theorems. You can never eliminate all the, you know, strategy, strategic voting stuff, but there'll be less of it under ranked choice voting. Um, you know, let me sit, throw a few others out there. Lots of people are pretty unhappy about the Electoral College and trying to explain to my daughter how you can win an election by five million votes and only barely sneak across the line. You know, the good thing about kids is they have a pretty innate sense of fairness and that kind of to her pretty undemocratic. And I explained to her that it had something to do with some people a couple of hundred years ago and she was wondering what the hell that should, why that should dictate her life and the value of her vote. Um, so as it currently stands in most presidential elections, most Americans don't matter. Um, that's absurd. Uh, let me give you my favorite. I come from Australia. We have compulsory voting. You know, Americans have never flinched about having a draft. It's okay to tell people they have to go overseas and shoot other people. But God help me, if you make me go to the ballot box once every four years, that is an affront to freedom. That's absurd. It's a civic duty. Uh, in Australia, we have elections on the weekend uh, to get out of work. Even better, they have a, a barbecue there so you can get a, a good sausage while you're there. It's, it's fantastic. Um, you know, these things are pretty simple. Uh, and we, I think every, everyone in the civics class at age 15 would agree that they're a good idea. And the question is, how do we move from that to actually reform our institutions to make them somewhat more democratic? So uh, let's move there. Uh, how do we uh, move to institutions that are more democratic? And uh, I mean, I've, I've always sort of thought the, the one surefire way to get rid of the electoral college is if a Democrat actually won by the electoral college and lost the popular vote. But uh, I don't see that happening anytime soon. So the the constitution is pretty tough on this question, right? Uh, uh, but perhaps we're gonna see more states do ranked choice voting? I mean, so that's one, you know, the states run a lot of, so getting rid of the electoral college is hard, but the electoral systems within states are up to the states. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, explaining ranked choice to a population that's not used to thinking about electoral specifics is hard work. But you know, Alaska showed it can be done. So um, there is a, seri a moderately serious grassroots movement there. Um, and you know, maybe we should be optimistic about it. Yeah, I think institutionally there are a few key things that that one could point to. Media segmentation is very tough to challenge because it's very difficult to to constrain free speech in that in the way that that might imply. Uh, 
gerrymandering and and having independent redistricting commissions is difficult but not impossible. I mean, some states have made headway in that direction. And look at the election results. Trump lost by five million votes or more, but but Republicans in in other races did quite well. They did better than people expected in the House. Uh, they controlled state legislatures. They won a number of gubernatorial races and so on. And so this was not a repudiation of the party. And 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 we still are going to look in the next election and the one after that at cases where the elections for those for those down ticket um, races are decided at the primary stage. They're not really decided in the general. And and that's that's I think a, a very important area for institutional reform. Campaign finance. Uh, it, I know it's not likely that Citizens United would be overturned by this Supreme Court, uh, but there has to be headway on on campaign finance reform so that there's a more democratic economic access to uh, uh, to politics. And uh, those those those, in my view, would be two two very important areas mm -hmm. for for systemic reform. I think I would just I would just add, first of all, I totally agree with John's point about gerrymandering. And I, I think that there's a lot of movement, including in Michigan, in that direction, which I think is great. But I think it's also important to remember that this, you know, was actually the largest turnout election, uh, historic turnout, in part because of um, absentee voting and mail-in balloting. And hopefully that will only continue. Uh, that way, the day of the week that we have the election doesn't matter as much. Um, and hopefully we'll have a leader who isn't, um, you know, convincing people not to use that method. Uh, and, um, and so that will continue to increase the number of voters out there. Although I'm quite enamored with Justin's uh, barbecue at the polls idea. So I think uh, <laughs> there was pizza a, at the polls this year. Platform to run on. <laughs> hey, Justin, I've been wondering about the polls. So, you know, I think there's been um, questions about what are the polls missing? Did they actually do all right in the in the end? Or uh, what do you see for the future of that whole industry that um, we all sort of follow day in and day out in the run up to an election? Yeah, so one of the funny things is we write the first draft of history of the election on election night, mm -hmm. but it turns out we count most of the votes in the week after. And on election night, it looked like a remarkably close race. The polls had said it wouldn't be close. So then we immediately started writing, why were the polls so dramatically wrong? Mm -hmm. And then you start counting New York and California, and of course, Biden wins by 5 million. Not as much as the polls said. There's clearly a polling error, but it was not a drastic polling error, but um, certainly not historically unprecedented. Um, look, one of the things I've talked a lot about, oh, uh, I think my camera just died. We can hear you. You're oh. kind of, you're doing a radio segment now. Yeah. Well, the good news <laughs> is I think I have a backup camera. Look at hey. that. Oh, oh, wow. Always keep a backup. Um, <laughs> John, didn't you have a backup? You know, I was, just, I was just about to say that you made me feel better for all my tech failures and then you were ready with backup. So. He came back. This one's much lower res. I'll so slink I'm away fine. in shame. Um, <laughs> one of the things I actually suggested in some of my past research is that we look at alternative ways of predicting elections. One of them is prediction markets. This is where you bet on the likely outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The argument that I'd made as an economist is that would yield a, a, more, a, a, a more statistically accurate result. Turns out it did. Um, you know, Nate Silver, I think, got 47 out of 50 states right, and the prediction market's got 49 out of 50. Depends exactly how you count. Um, another, uh, so, you know, it wasn't an unmitigated disaster. But I will say public polling, as we understand it and as we teach it, is in trouble. The idea, of course, is, you know, you find a random sample of the population. Uh, the problem is that in reality, for many of these polls, as few as 3% of people are answering their phones. And I know how to teach you statistics and how you can talk about reweighting, But if that 3% is in any way crazy or weird compared to the other 97, there's no statistical wizardry that can get you out of that. And that, uh, I think that's a big part of the problem. And um, the future for polling is going to be what we call convenience samples mm -hmm. rather than representative samples. We literally cannot find a representative cross-section of Americans anymore. And the, the question is, how do you... Look, it makes what you and I do much more valuable. How do you use statistics um, to take the data we have, which is not the data you want, and try to get some sort of insight? So we didn't have a catastrophic failure this year. We had a big failure, um, same as 2016. 
Um, but I think big failures may well be the norm. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone, we have about five minutes left. Uh, Shabita, I wanted to ask you about the transition. So it seems like we're having a, a transition from one to uh, the next administration um, like we never had, or you know, uh, just not a, a sharing of information. And I wonder uh, if you could talk about um, how that impacts planning for you know, uh, a new sort of set of strategies and all those things that we wanna do um, to confront COVID. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing, which is obvious, but needs to be said, is that at the same time as this transition from now until January 20th or 21st is also the greatest, we're at the greatest risk for getting COVID. And the vast, yeah. vast majority of us are not going to have a vaccine by January 21st. So um, that is, Part of what makes this incredibly uh, a difficult time, and it means that you know the it's going to uh, continue to be a problem in the early spring, where we continue. Most of us will not have a vaccine. COVID will be raging around the country, and the Biden uh, presidency will have to catch up. And on a really mundane basis, what this means is that right now, anyway. Um, you know, it means that lower level staffers in health and human services and the Centers for Disease Control um, and other places can't communicate with uh, with their uh, counterparts in the transition team. And so, you know, what are the vaccine distribution plans, for example? That's information that they have at HHS, that they have in the Department of Defense, um, that they have in Operation Warp Speed, but that by the Biden transition team doesn't have access to. And so if they're start trying to plan out what the vaccine distribution plan should look like, what is the role that the federal government needs to play relative to the states, which is a key question, obviously, uh, that is that kind of planning can only happen slightly in the dark. One of the um, bittersweet dimensions of this is that People, you know, whistleblowers like Rick Bright, who was part of the Operation Warp Speed and, and resigned a few weeks ago, are now advising the Biden transition team. And that's happened uh, in a lot of places. So that's the way that uh, that they're getting some of the key information. Uh, but in terms of a handoff, I think the the. Um, metaphor that I heard recently that I think is useful is that it's a relay race and if someone is stop, has to stop uh, in the middle and um, wait that you know to get the baton that obviously causes problem when you have a pandemic that is not stopped that's actually accelerating uh, and that's so all of the issues that I described with it with regards to the vaccine is also going to be true when it comes to the test trace and isolation um, program that we need to rely on for you know at least the next six to eight months. John, if I can rely on you to uh, speak for a minute, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the transition and foreign policy. I'll say two things. One is there's a lot of information, especially intelligence, that needs to be passed between the current administration and the new administration. And the signals we're hearing out of Washington are not very positive on the score. Uh, I hope the people who are currently in office will have the sort of responsibility and concern for our country's security to pass that on faithfully. And secondly, there are still a number of things that this administration can do to make situation more difficult for the Biden administration when they enter, whether it's in the Persian Gulf or in a variety of other other theaters. And again, uh, I think this is a it's a it's a crucial time for people to uh, to put uh, the national interest first and 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 not a partisan interest. Uh, uh, things things going smoothly would go a long way toward helping the new administration uh, advance American values and interests abroad. Mm -hmm. Shobita, John, Justin, thanks so much for spending an hour and a half with me. I've uh, really uh, loved it and uh, I've learned so much and I just really, um, I'm just really grateful to be your colleague. And uh, I'm really grateful to everyone who tuned in. Thanks for uh, spending your time with us. I know uh, there's a lot on screen. And so it, it's, um, it's great that you would. And, and if you know any um, folks who are thinking about master's degrees, of course, the Ford School has uh, uh, got, uh, you know, in our recruitment season for our MPP uh, class. And so I hope you will uh, consider, if you like what you saw, uh, send them our way. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it over to a video that's gonna play of Nicole Taylor, who's the president of the U of M Club of Washington, DC. Hi everyone, 
My name is Nicole Taylor, and I'm the president of the University of Michigan Alumni Club in Washington, D.C. I hope you all enjoyed our post-election recap event tonight. I would like to take a minute to thank the Ford School for their partnership on this event, and Dean Barr and all of our other speakers for the great insight they have provided tonight. I'd also like to take a minute to thank our volunteers who have worked on this event and all of our other recent virtual events. If you'd like more information on our upcoming events, I encourage you to check out our website, umdc.org, or any of our social media channels to get more information. If you'd like to help plan events like this one, or you want to get involved in our club in any other ways, please feel free to email me at president at umdc.org. Thank you all for attending this event tonight, and we hope to see you at another UMDC event.